Okay, good morning, everybody. It's a pleasure to be with all of you today uh, in this other uh, event that we're constantly doing in really reaching out to some of the thought leaders uh, in the world uh, to help us navigate and understand what's happening uh, with these huge challenges around COVID. We are today with the Chief Economic Advisor of Allianz, one of the largest uh, uh, asset managers and pension funds in, in the world. Uh, he's not only one of the greatest thinkers of our time, but equally he's had a, a tremendous understanding of financial markets and the global economy, uh, which we're gonna talk to about today. Uh, Mohammed has uh, not only run uh, Harvard's endowment, he's been at the PIMCO, he's been at the IMF, uh, and now at, at Allianz. So he has a, a very deep experience uh, to help us uh, kind of give us a perspective of how he sees the world and more importantly, some of the implications uh, that he sees, especially coming to emerging markets. Uh, but I would like perhaps, uh, Mohammed, that you start and give us your take on how you're seeing things today and then we can start having a question and answer period and I will be passing along to you many of the questions of both my colleagues and, and people who are listening in. So over to you, Mohammed, and thank you again for being with us today. Um, thank you, President Marino, and, and thank you all for tuning in. I hope you, you and your families are safe. Um, please take care during this very unusual, uncertain and unsettling time. Um, as I'm really eager to get to, to, to your questions, let me just make four points. Um, the first three are general points centered mainly on advanced economies. But after all, if you live in the developing world, your neighborhood is defined by the advanced economy. So it's really important to understand the neighborhood in which we're all living. And the fourth point will focus in particular on developing countries in Latin America. The first point is that we are dealing with something that is truly unprecedented and where there is cognitive difficulty in appreciating the importance of the moment, a generation defining moment. If you have lived in a fragile economy, if you have lived through a major calamity, natural disaster, you know what a sudden stop looks like of the economy when both demand and supply are destroyed simultaneously. If you've lived in the advanced world, you've never experienced it. And we have certainly never experienced it at the level of the global economy. So the first thing to just recognize is that people are, are still trying to understand what has hit them so suddenly. And it takes time. It takes time to internalize it and it takes time to respond properly. And the second thing to realize is this is much more complicated because the health issue raises three inconsistencies that cannot be resolved quickly. The first inconsistency is what this stage of the health policy response dictates, social distancing, isolation, separation, for good reasons, and what the economy is wired for, exactly the opposite, integration, connectivity. So that tension is massive and it is particularly painful for the economy because we will put health first as we should. The second tension is between individual reactions and, global re and, and collective reactions. Individually, we are led to do something that's not in our collective interest. And the third is between national interests and global interests. And what we have seen is massive home bias in this process. Because of these three things, not only are we gonna have a recession, a very big recession, and I think that, that the numbers um, that have come out, including the great publication that the IED, that the Internet Development Bank and the American Development Bank has done, that the IDB has done, are really amazing work. But I worry that we may have even more of a hit to the global economy. And you need only look at the U.S. numbers, including today's jobless claims, to understand the calamity that has hit the global economy. The U.S. alone has lost 26 million jobs in five weeks. 
that is 16% of the labor force. That takes the unemployment rate already to 20%, and the highest that was reached during the Great Depression was 25%. So that should give you a feel for that. The second point I'd like to make is that the challenge ahead involves both the journey and the destination. The focus right now is on the journey, but the destination is also important to look to. Because in a perfect world, you, you handle the journey in a way that's consistent with your destination. We should not repeat the mistake of the global financial crisis. And the mistake of the global financial crisis, the advanced economies, was winning the war against a global depression. That was won. But we lost the peace. We lost the peace of securing a durable, inclusive, sustainable, growing global economy. We risk today of coming out in an even worse place. Even if we win the war against the global depression, we risk coming out with the following four features. First, a much less productive supply side. Because of the home buyers, there will be a massive tendency to rewire supply chains towards your home. Efficiency, just-in-time inventory control, cost-effective global supply lines will be sacrificed for resilience. That means a less productive economy in the short term. The demand side is a major question whether we emerge as more cautious consumers. Will we repeat the experience of the Great Depression, of the frugal generation, where people spent less. On the balance sheet side, we emerge with higher debt. So less productivity, less dynamic demand, higher debt. We know what that is a recipe for. That is a recipe for lower potential growth. And then the fourth element is this is the third blow to globalization in nine years. I'm not sure we're going to survive this third blow. We may enter a process of deglobalization, which will make everything even more sluggish. So it's really important that when people are managing through this crisis to keep an eye on what the destination looks like. And that right now, is not being done for understandable reasons. In fact, it's one of the four main traps, and this is my third point, that we need to keep an eye on. Whether you are a multilateral policymaker, whether you're a national policymaker, whether you're a company or whether you're a household, you've got to be aware of these four traps. And the first one is, as I mentioned, is this notion between the journey and the destination. We have to manage to both. The second one is this temptation to have false precision. I was on, on, on a TV show a month ago and I was shown estimates for US growth that went to the decimal point. And I was asked to react and I said, this is false precision. To use the US term, we don't even know what zip code we're in. And yet, going to one decimal point suggests that we, we know the apartment built number in the building, in the street, in the zip code. We don't. What we're going through is something totally unprecedented that our models cannot capture. So be careful of false precisions. This is an environment for scenario analyses. This is an environment for loss of humilities. This is an environment for asking the question, not are we likely to make a mistake, Yes, we are. The world is inherently uncertain. It's inherently unsettling. There are health questions that no one can answer, not even the health experts. Of course, we're likely to make a mistake. The real question is what mistake can we afford to make because most mistakes are recoverable and what mistake can we not afford to make? It's what I call regret minimization. The third element is something that the advanced economies are discovering that's very familiar to those of us that have worked in the developing world, adjustment fatigue. You can keep people focused for a while, but you can't keep them focused well for a long time. 
people that have gone through structural reforms know about adjustment fatigues. And we're starting to see it. The US will be reopening some states too early. And when you reopen states too early, you risk what Singapore went through, which is a W. You come back only to come back down. And the damage that's created on that second down wave is actually quite consequential. So just be aware that by definition, there's going to be adjustment fatigue, and that has to be proactively managed. And the final point comes from game theory. It makes a very big difference whenever you're approaching a challenge, whether in game theory terms, and I don't want to suggest that this is a game, this is not a game, but game theory gives you a lot of insights. Whether you're playing a one-round game or a multi-round game, your strategy for a one-round game is very different than the strategy for a multi-round game. If you're running a 50-meter sprint, it is very different from run, running a five-kilometer run. We have stumbled collectively into a one-round policy response. And if this turns out to be not one round, but multi-rounds, we are going to be challenged in terms of policy effectiveness. And policy effectiveness right now is about containing the damage so that liquidity problems don't become solvency problem, so that structural damage isn't permanent, so that bankruptcies don't destroy the productive base. Which leads me to Latin America. I, I've been on the phone with many of my friends that are policymakers talking about that. And two things have really hit me. One came from a Latin American policymaker. He says, Mohammed, you have no idea what's hitting us. We're being hit from all sides, and that's before, before we get a really major outbreak. We're being hit by lower exports, lower commodity prices. We're being hit by a massive outflow of capital. We are being hit by less tourism. And on top of all that, we are having difficulty securing imports of key items. And we haven't even have to dealt with the major outbreak that we worried about. We are preparing as well as can be, but you know what our, our healthcare system looks like. You know that our ability to social distance is much less. And that for me was very um, sobering. And of course, add to that, that the ability to use the, the game plan of the advanced economies is, is, is less possible because of much less fiscal and monetary space. And in fact, certain countries outside Latin America, in fact, inside Latin America, are already risking a negative spillover from the exchange rate. But if that's sobering, let me tell you another thing that I heard from an African policymaker. He said, in the West, the race you have is between policy advances and infection rates. It's, that is the race you have. In Africa, where the whole of Zimbabwe has five, five ventilators, where Nigeria with 200 million people has 500 ventilators, there, the race that we're in is the race between dying from infection or dying from hunger. I say that because the challenge that is facing the developing world is a multiple of the challenge that is facing the advanced economies. And it's therefore really important, really important to develop three muscles and develop them as fast. And I'm really glad to see that the IDB, the IMF are all working to try and help that. But more needs to be done by the bilateral creditors and by the private creditors. The first one is resilience. You have to be able to navigate this journey. This journey will end, but it will, the destination becomes irrelevant if destruction is enormous. So developing financial resilience right now should be key at every level. 
and preemptive, preemptive ways of doing so are absolutely critical. Secondly, optionality. The ability to generate a number of scenarios to learn from the information coming in, to mid-course correct if needed, and to make sure you don't become prisoners of the past thinking. And the last one is agility. And agility is about being able to respond to the destination. It will be different. It looks risky, but let me tell you, there's also a lot of opportunities in this new destination. You just have to do things today in crisis management mode that are consistent with the post-crisis landscape. Let me stop here, President Moreno, and happy to take any questions on any topic. Well, this is great uh, opening and, and truly sobering what you just uh, described uh, because it touches on the many challenges that as this virus spreads into the Southern Hemisphere, both in Africa and Latin America, and the way you described our challenges, uh, you know, plus the sudden stop uh, that we're currently seeing. Uh, the reality is that, uh, you know, if you look at Latin America in the last five years, we probably had on average, the lowest growth we've had in many, many years. And the, and the more troubling part that you correctly address is the fact that all the gains that we made in terms of people moving out of poverty now are at risk, but are at risk after just four or five weeks. We now see that we could, you know, extreme poverty could increase by 2% percentage points, the number of uh, unemployed, the same thing without you know, this, the safety nets that you have in, in, in countries like the United States with unemployment insurance. So it all takes us going from, the, from, you know, talking about the destination, the lack of international cooperation and the capacity to, pre, you know, to prevent that liquidity uh, uh, crisis from becoming a solvency one. Where do you see thinking around this? Because if we are not able to solve this in the Southern Hemisphere, be it in Africa or in Latin America, the, the, the virus itself and that our factor of spread of the virus will continue. How do you see that response uh, coming together? So, so I think two points that you raise that are very important. One is the initial conditions. You know, there's this famous Irish joke of, 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 of a stranger asking someone in a village, how do I get to Dublin? And the person responds, I wouldn't start from here if you wanted to get to Dublin. I would start from somewhere else. If we knew about the crisis coming, we would have taken our initial conditions much more seriously. And our initial conditions had two elements to it. You're absolutely right, growth was sluggish to begin with. And the second one is that Latin America, like other parts of the world, had benefited from an enormous amount of capital that had not been pulled into the region, but pushed into the region by the activities of central banks in the advanced world. Literally, capital got pushed in. It's what I call tourist dollars. What does a tourist typically do? A tourist picks up in the middle of a European winter, picks up a prospectus here and, and looks at the beauty of the beaches in Latin America and goes there. The tourist is being pushed by the weather in the Northern Hemisphere. And then if, as typically happens in these countries, something goes wrong, the first reaction of the tourist is to go to the airport and leave. So the other initial condition is that the underestimation by, by investors of the liquidity risk going in, including the proliferation of ETFs that made it very easy to get exposure to Latin sovereigns and Latin corporates, means that when the capital reverses, it reverses in a violent and sudden way. So these are not good initial conditions, but it is what it is, right? So we look forward and it is very important, as I say, to be preemptive to the extent possible in developing resilience. The good news on the, on the global cooperation side is that institutions have moved quickly. Your own institution, President Moreno, 
the IMF not only in making emergency lending facilities, but also finding a way to de facto refinance obligations owed to the, to the IMF in the next six months. The G20 has signed off on the importance of bilateral debt relief, and that includes China, which is a major win. And now there's, there's, there's thinking going on about how do you involve the private sector in orderly, and I want to stress the word orderly, is orderly is very important, in orderly debt relief where needed. It is good that we're talking about this now as opposed to the loss crisis in Latin America in the 80s, where defaults happened on a wide scale and then we had to, to, to try and clean it up. Because defaults are really costly. There are ways to avoid defaults through orderly preemptive elements. So that's positive. What's less positive is that beyond that, we have seen even less global policy coordination than we did during the global financial crisis. And this is a crisis as a multiple of the global financial crisis. Um, we, have, we are nowhere near a London's April 2009 G20 meeting. What we're seeing, in fact, is the opposite. We're seeing home bias dominate. I don't think you get over that problem quickly, but I do know there's an imperfect solution to it. And that is the private sector. And I would encourage um, people on this call to look at what is happening in the private sector and to look at cross-border private-public partnerships. The pharma industry, the pharmaceutical industry is doing a lot. The technology tech industry is doing a lot into trying to help with tracing, tracking. And this is key because if, and I hope this doesn't happen, but if we get massive outbreaks to, of the COVID-19 crisis in Latin America, there's three elements to the solution. The magic element comes later, a vaccine, immunity, community immunity, that comes later. You can't rely on that. The first two come earlier, but you have to work hard. The first one is being able to identify who has the virus, track and, and contact trace. Technology helps a great deal in this. And the second one is getting the healthcare system to a level where we can treat illnesses. It's not just about health, about beds and ventilators, it's also about medical aids that make sure that we don't just depend on the, keeping a patient alive so they can fight off um, the, the infection. I say that because in these first two elements, we're seeing a lot of private coalitions coming together and trying to address this. And they know that the biggest vulnerability is in the developing world. So I would, I would encourage first to preemptively think about orderly debt relief and second, to preemptively think about engaging um, the private sector in these solutions. Uh, I, I, there's, you know, you talked about, you know, kind of this peak of global, globalization that we reached, uh, let's say, right before the financial crisis. You wrote that very clearly in, 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 your, in your book, which I highly recommend, The Only Game in Town, which looks at all the lessons of the financial crisis. Um, and here is somebody in Mexico who works as a licensed customs broker in the U.S.-Mexico border. And he's asking about how the changes of what's defined as essential businesses between the U.S. and Mexico are starting already to cause uh, supply chain disruptions. Do you see a chance of re-engaging across value chains in this hemisphere, across the Americas, and certainly, of course, Mexico, the most integrated country into the U.S. economy. But do you see as, if one looks at some of the, the opportunities going forward out of this crisis, is there a real chance to think of not just made in America, but made in the Americas? So I think there is, but one has to be very sober about the environment in which one is going to operate for a while. We entered this, 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 this crisis with a number of unthinkables. You know, I keep a list of unthinkables and I never thought it would get this long. 
And this is before you added negative price for oil, which was three days ago, but it included negative interest rates. Who would have ever thought that you could have negative interest rates? And one of the things that's included was the champion of free trade, the United States, becoming the most protectionist advanced economy. That was an unthinkable, but that has happened. Now, it may have happened for good reasons, and I do think there were legitimate um, grievances against China. And it's not just the US had it, a lot of other countries showed, shared them. But once you let the genie out of the bottle of protectionism, it's very difficult to put the genie back in. Because protectionism can serve not just economic objectives, making trade both free and fair, but it can also serve all hosts of other objectives that have nothing to do with economics. And that's why that, that economists really worry about when the genie of protectionism is out, is out of, the, the, is out of the, the bottle. And it is right now. So I think we have to be very sober about what we are fighting against. Having said that, I can see substitution effects ben benefiting Latin America, and in particular, benefiting Mexico. Because Mexico is part of, as we know, um, a trade ag agreement that comes with a lot of safeguards, legal safeguards. And as people rewire global chains, I think that in relative terms, relative terms, Latin America and Mexico in particular are better positioned than China is, for example. Okay. Thank you for that. Here's another question. He says, the U.S. Congress and the Fed seem to have adopted a whatever-it-takes approach to protecting the U.S. economy. Do you foresee any major imbalances that this will create down the road in the U.S. and in and the broader world economy? And, of course, those effects will be severely felt in Latin America. So, first, I think we should, we should welcome um, the three principles that have guided U.S. policy. One, you just cited President Moreno, whatever it takes. The second was all in, we're all in. And the third was whole of government. We're gonna see coordination like we've never seen coordination before. And for those of us who, 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 who I worked at the IMF for, for, for 15 years, so I lived through many crises. Um, we know how important these three principles are. Because again, I keep on stressing, you don't want short-term problems to become structural impediments long-term. So I think we should welcome that. Having said that, there, there, there is the risk of what I call the one round game. And let me take the example of the Fed. I was very supportive of the Fed coming in to normalize the functioning of the treasury market. That is a key market for virtually every single other asset class in the world. And if that market had broken down and we came this close to that market breaking down on, two, on a Tuesday about four weeks ago, had that market broken down, then we would not just be dealing today with a global depression, but we, like the 1930s, but we would be dealing with a global financial crisis like 2008. So our situation would have been a lot worse. The Fed, through, with the support of, of the Treasury, came in in a major way. And what it did is address the top levels of the capital structure. Treasuries, money markets, mortgages. These are elements that if you don't stabilize them, you don't stabilize the financial system. And the functioning of the financial system becomes in play. That's the good news. The less good news is that the Fed has felt inclined to come down all the way to capital structure. And 10 days ago, it announced that it would now be buying high yield bonds. Those are junk bonds. Those are, those are bonds uh, that are rated below triple B. Now, you may think that's good news, 
But let me tell you what that implies. First, it implies the Fed picking winners and losers among the corporate world. Why is it supporting a fallen angel and not another company? Second, because it will also be buying the index, it means the Fed is exposed to default risk. It acts as a fiscal agency in a very explicit manner. Third, it, it risks reputational damage. Fourth, it risks political interference. Fifth, this has encouraged equity investors to say, well, let me get this right. The Fed has come all the way down the capital structure and is just one step above stocks in the capital structure. Of course, it would support stocks next. So we are support, supporting moral hazard in the system. To the extent that these risks materialize, these are longer term risks. And these are longer term risks that will, will, will influence the one thing that is very important in the, in the issuer of the global currency, and that is trust in institutions. A lot of people on this call know how important institutions are to economic well-being. And, and so I worry about that. I, I think that that, that that question is really important that like any emergency reaction, you certainly don't want to make the best the enemy of the good because in crisis management, if you make the best the enemy of the good, you don't move quickly enough. But also you need to know what bridge is too far to cross. And I think that that, that is an important consideration when it comes to the longer term effects as asked in your question. Great. Uh, another, you know, kind of related to that is you've written a lot about the, uh, the pandemic and, and how most of us will succumb to some degree of paralysis or overreaction or both. How do you find that right balance? You know, it's hard. Um, and, and understand, I, I'm a great, as you know, President Moreno, I'm a great believer in behavioral science because behavioral science gives you an insight on policy effectiveness. Why is it that people seem to make mistakes over and over again? And there's, there, there's, good, re there's good reasons for that. And that's because we're wired in a certain way. As human, we're wired in a certain way. So we know certain things about what happens when you take someone out of their comfort zone. There are those who will deny being taken out of their comfort zone. Denial. Denial is very strong. You know, but you, if you are under home um, mandates and you can't go out, you can't deny that your reality has changed. The second element is, is to do what married couples do very well. You hear one thing, you don't like it, so you, you reframe it to mean something else. Again, it's very difficult to reframe our reality right now. But the third trap is, is the biggest trap. And that's what leads to either paralysis or overreaction. And that is the trap of what's called active inertia. Let me, let me use an impolite example and let me use a polite example. The impolite example is a American tourist that visits Latin America that asks in English something to a local. And the local doesn't understand English. So the local does like this. The most likely reaction of the American tourists is to say the same thing in English, louder and slower. So the active part is that some, I'm not getting through, I need to do something different. The inertia side is you do the same thing. You don't change the way you do things. Successful companies have almost gone bankrupt because of that. IBM on the eve of the PC revolution in the early 80s was the best place company to win the PC war. It was the most recognizable brand in technology, trusted brand in technology. It had the biggest research and development budget and, and it was very profitable. Research by Don Sull at the London Business School shows that management and the board had agreed on absolutely the right strategy, that this was a major disruption to, to their industry, that they could no longer continue doing what they've done very well, but they had to supplement that by tail strategies. 
One tail strategy was to enter a space that they were not in, the PC. And the other tail strategy was to take part of their mainframe upstream in order to charge premium pricing. Because by charging premium pricing, they could afford to subsidize this, the infant industry argument that we're all familiar with, and they could maintain margins overall. That was the absolutely right strategy. So imagine the right brand, lots of money, the right strategy. When it came to implementation, the inertia in the system was so strong that they completely underemphasized the tail strategies and they instead overemphasized this, what they were doing. And had they not reinvented themselves today to a different company, they wouldn't exist. IBM. So if you apply that, what you end up by doing, if you're not careful, is you say, okay, I'm not in denial. I'm not reframing. I am responding. But if, you, if you're not willing to ask yourself basic questions, like, should I be looking at this different? What assumptions am I, am I applying here? What models am I using? You will have a cognitive trap. And that cognitive trap either results in paralysis or overreacting by doing things that are ineffective. Pushing on a string being an example of that. Um, so one has to be very honest with oneself and ask the question, and I'm sorry to repeat it, but I think it's a key question. And it's not the right question. We always want to ask when someone comes with a policy proposal, with an investment proposal, go, so how, how does it work? What goes right? The question you should ask right now is whenever someone shows you something, is what mistake can result from this and can I afford it? And by simply changing that, the other side around, I think you can get over some of the behavioral traps that are inherent when you're taken out of your comfort zone. It's a fa fascinating point and is how companies have to rethink in this new moment that we're in and, and trying to navigate from the old to the new. And I think that's the, uh, for everybody, for individuals, for governments, and certainly for businesses. Uh, the, you know, one of the big debates here in the United States recently, as, uh, and as we saw this uh, new stimulus that is happening, is for small businesses. And there, there is a, a question here, which I, I find that, that is very, very timely. Is how, you know, in a region like ours that has huge informality, 50% of the people are in the informal labor markets, how do you protect jobs in small and medium businesses and especially that last mile, because normally you see a lot of companies that will go broke. How do you bring it back up? Where do you see that there is some space for, for thinking in a more creative way in this space? This is certainly one of the big areas of preserving jobs. Yeah, and, and it's very sobering because even the United States has discovered that it doesn't have the pipes to get the relief as quickly to the places it wants it to go. Okay, so, so this is the problem is that the pipes are not in place. So you are building the pipes as you're trying to get the relief out and inevitably you will end up by missing people. So, uh, you know, one cannot underestimate the challenge ahead. Um, and that challenge of course is built enormously, it's increased enormously um, when it comes to developing countries where the informal sector um, is, is so dominant. Um, Pretty much, I don't have an answer. I really don't have an answer. Um, I think we have stumbled into recognizing that the more the pipes are failing, the more you may have to bypass the corporate sector and have to go directly to basic income approaches. Um, but, but there is no... I wish I had an answer for you. There is no easy approach. I mean, I'm involved here with the food bank. They have never seen lines as long as they have. And these are people who simply can't access um, the, the support that, that governments are trying to give to them. And, and for stupid reasons, right? I mean, stupid is dark work. For, for silly reasons, they're unable to do it. And the result is, is hunger. So I, I don't have easy answers other than you have to continuously learn, be open to getting data back, be open to adjust your approaches. 
um, and protect people. It's about ultimately protecting people. One other question, uh, Mohammed, of course, is uh, that affects Latin America in a big way is, is commodities. You've seen the, the downward pressures on both mineral commodities and food commodities. It's certainly much deeper in mineral commodities because they're associated with, with global supply chains and especially the demands uh, from, from the Western countries. But what do you, what do you make of this whole uh, impact that oil prices will have on the overall uh, situation with commodities as a whole? And I know you've been talking a lot about that. I would love to, to hear your point. So I, I think one has to be careful when it comes to the compare and contrast from the oil market to the rest of um, the, the, the commodities. And if you don't do that, you end up being too pessimistic. Undoubtedly, both, both oil and other commodities share a common global factor, and that is lower demand. The lower demand is coming not just from, from the consumption side, but also in terms, as you pointed out, that, that, that why things are going to be rewired and, and you can't even move certain commodities these days. So the common global factor is a significant slump in, the, slump in demand. But oil had another imbalance that people don't quite understand if you don't live in the financial market. And that is a financial imbalance. It is when it is finance here it, that wags the dog over here. So think of the tail and the dog. The dog is, is physical, physical imbalances, supply and demand. Most commodities have that. Oil had a very peculiar financial imbalance. And let me, let me, let me try and simplify just to show you what was at play. Because you'll notice today, oil prices continue to go up, even though the physical side, all the indications are negative. Um, let, let me pick on one, on one element in particular. There was an ETF. An ETF is an exchange traded funds that allows investors to access certain segments of the market in a, in a rather easy manner. Because what's implicit about an ETF is that you offer instantaneous liquidity. You can buy and sell instantaneously at that prevailing price. And you offer it at reasonable bid offer prices. So that ETF called USO, the US oil fund, got enormous inflows of money when oil prices came down and the OPEC agreement suggested that we may be at the bottom. That fund was designed badly. It was designed to inf invest in the first contract, future contract. Hedge funds who are very smart and who always look at where the pain trade is realize that that fund was going to have to roll, sell, go into the next contract. Because if you don't go into the next contract, you get physical delivery of oil. And the last thing the fund wants is physical delivery of oil. Where are you going to store it? How expensive? What environmental risk? So the fund is forced to move. So what did, what did they do? They front ran that trade. And they sold so much out of the fund contract that that fund contract went into negative territory. That technical is over. Why? Because the, the fund has now changed its rules that allow it to invest in, in the succession of future contracts. So yes, oil tells you something about the physical imbalance, but it way overstates the physical imbalance because the oil market was also hit by a really bad financial imbalance. Another question is, you know, talking about the, the, the medical response and how do you, you know, you, you've talked from the very beginning that uh, and you identified that the shocks coming to the, to the uh, stock markets uh, would not finish those shocks until there was a real clarity 
in terms of what happened uh, to a vaccine or a real solution. Do you think the, 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 the markets have already priced in or how much do you think the markets have priced in uh, that possibility? And on the contrary, do you see that we're going to continue to see a lot of volatility? I remember you saying, you know, the, the markets go up and down with a certain band. It initially was a thousand. Now it's been closing maybe now to 200 to 50. That, of course, has a huge implication on, on what happens to, to emerging markets as a result and how people begin to, to manage their own liquidity. And more importantly, how they take a view on risk because I think this, this huge volatility begins to take people's uh, animal spirits uh, much more constrained. And that, I just, you know, that part of the question, a couple of questions around that very same subject coming in. And that's a great question, President Moreno. Um, let me start with a startling fact. The PE ratio today of the US stock market is equal to the P.E. ratio of the, of the record level in February. So we are back to valuations of record level. Yes, prices has, have fallen, but earnings are falling much more. Right? So how could it be that with all this risk aversion building in corporate consumer, that the market's risk aversion is as, is as low as it was there, or it's risk-loving thing? There are three explanations. The first explanation is the market is wrong. The market has been conditioned to buy every dip because that strategy has worked miracles. And therefore the market is doing whatever it's done before. Okay, it's just repeating its conditioning. The second interpretation is the optimistic one. The market is forward looking. The market is, doesn't care about the journey, doesn't care about earning results, doesn't care about all that, but the market has seen daylight. The market has understood that we are gonna come out of this and therefore you should bet on future earnings which are gonna be a lot higher than last year's earnings. Then there's a third interpretation. The markets feel that they're in a win-win situation. Either they will bet right and get the bounce back, or they will bet wrong and they'll get the Fed safety net. That whatever you do, you end up winning because the Fed will come in and buy stocks. And why is that powerful? Because the Fed has a printing press in the basement. The Fed can buy as much as it wants. So I think what's happening right now is, is a combination of over-optimism and especially, especially dependence on the Fed. That is why we have seen this remarkable um, coming back. I, as an investor, I don't believe that moral hazard trades are good trades. Maybe it's a value issue, value judgment, but I, I lived in emerging markets. I, 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 I traded in emerging markets professionally and I never felt comfortable with the IMF uh, moral hazard trade. Okay, I think that you, sh you should invest on the basis of fundamentals, but that is me, I'm a dinosaur. Okay, other people think differently. Um, so I am not comfortable. Having said that, the bottom up is really important. And when I'm told, what should we do as investors at this point? In early February, when, because I had worked on Sudan in the 80s when I was at the IMF, I had seen what, what a sudden economic sudden stop looks like. I was warning, be careful, this is different. Economic sudden stops are not like financial sudden stop. Financial sudden stop is a massive heart attack. You know exactly where, where it hits. Yes, it risks paralyzing everything else, but if you get quickly to the heart, you solve it. Economic sudden stops are very different. They start with an infection in the leg, an infection in the arm, another infection in the other arm, another infection in the leg, and suddenly you reach critical mass. And at that point, you don't know which infections to treat. You don't know what sequence to treat them in. Right? So having seen that, 
And having seen what sudden stops do to supply and demand destruction, the call in early February, and it's been a very well documented, was avoid risk assets. Then the call evolved to say, you know what? There are quality assets, quality assets that are now worth looking at, which was those with very strong balance sheets, loss of cash, positive cash generation, and had attributes that spoke to where we're going. The big tech companies had that. Netflix had that. Um, healthcare has, has that. At this stage, I think even these names are fairly valued. They're not as compelling as they were before. That's my own view, okay? Um, but I must say that, that I know what would prove me wrong, which is that the Fed ends up buying equities. Um, if I end up making a mistake, I would rather make a mistake of leaving money on the table than, 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 than having capital eroded because we are going to see, unfortunately, President Moreno, we're going to see a series of corporate defaults which completely erase capital. That is an unrecoverable investment mistakes. Most investment mistakes are recoverable over time. A default is not. And we are also, I'm, I'm afraid, going to see um, some sovereign defaults as well. Uh, going on that, there's another question here. And, and I'm sorry, we're, we're not going to be able to accommodate the many, many, many questions that we have here. But about what's your opinion about per perpetual bonds as a uh, way for developing governments or emerging markets to obtain a financing a under these situations, and do you see space for things like that to, to begin to happen? So, so first and foremost, um, I see space for orderly relationships. Um, we have colleagues from, Ar from Argentina, and I would tell you as someone who cares about the developing world, okay, be careful of ultimatums um, because an orderly restructuring, um, an orderly debt relief allows you to recover much more quickly. And I think you'd be surprised to how amenable creditors are. Um, I think the examples of Uruguay, and I can cite you many other examples, are not exceptions. Okay. But, but how, how you negotiate is as important as what you negotiate on. Um, so it's important that, that first people have a mindset that this is a common problem. That, that creditors, at the end of the day, multiply two things, the probability of payment and how much are going to get paid. Right? And whether it's a perpetual bond, whether it is a GDP warrant, whether all that, the idea here is to better align incentives between creditors and debtors. And, and we are fortunate enough to have different ways of doing this. Right? And I, I encourage countries when they think of issuing the, the investor base, of asking the question, am I engaging with sustainable investors? Are they resident investors, like foreign direct investment, it comes in and stays, or are they tourist investors? It makes a big, big difference. And if they are tourist investors, I better align the incentives. Otherwise, they're gonna be, go from feast to famine, and I'm gonna go from feast to famine with them. So, so I see a lot of um, scope for better aligning creditor and debtor incentives, better discussing debt relief. It's in everybody's interest that we com com continue with normalized um, relationship where actual payments is in line with capacity to pay. And there's many ways um, of doing that. That's where a lot of our ingenuity is going to have to come, like, like you correctly say. say. Uh, I know there's so many other questions, and, and I'm very mindful of our time, but I wanted to perhaps end with a question uh, to you is, with all of this crisis, there's always opportunity, and there should be a better tomorrow because humanity always strives and has the capacity to overcome, and that's what history demonstrates. Uh, after humanity has been through severe, severe problems in the past, and it's always these times where you find humanity in its capacity to innovate in ways uh, that, you know, we can only see through history. So how do you see that? And, and get us, you know, after this very sovereign talk, 
uh, a little bit of optimism, which is always healthy uh, to have. So I completely, I completely agree with you. And I say this to, to, my, to my two daughters, okay, who have seen their lives completely disrupted, nothing compared to others. Okay, but, but you know, when, when they're, your daughters, they complain all the time. So, so you have to. Um, so, so I think there's two elements of that. One is just recognize the situation you're in. What we did in our house is every day we spend some time talking about the latest news and tracing scenarios. And the more you, you, you internalize um, what you're going through, the more you can start looking to the other side. And there is a sunny other side. And I'm, I'm really happy, President Marino, that you stressed this. There is a sunny other side, okay? But in order to, to get to that, you have to understand the journey. And, you know, you, tr you drive your kids five hours to an amusement park for the first five, for four hours and a half, all you're going to hear is, are we there yet? Are we there yet? Are we there yet? Okay. So unless you, they, they understand, it takes five hours and show them the map on a GPS. Okay. The whole, by the time you get there, the family relationships have broken down completely. Um, so there's an element of, of, of navigating the journey. Already, we have a lot of silver linings. Let me cite a few. One is recognition of tail risks. Tail risks are low probability event with massive impact. In the old days, you, you talk about a tail risk, climate change, which is actually not a tail risk at all, but it was treated by too many by, as a tail risk. People say, oh, the probability is so low. Okay, now that people realize that consequential tail risks are a multiplication, and you better look at the consequence of that. A pandemic was a low risk, if, but look at us all now. And I think that certain other things that have been ignored, climate change is, 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 is something that's going to be different on the other side. And that's good for every generation. Second thing, I think what you said earlier, President Moreno, is that collective responsibility is going to play in much more importantly. Yes, we are going through a phase where every country is trying to do it itself. But we all know that a vaccine will be universal. We all know that positive solutions are universal. And I'm hoping that we come out of this thinking, you know what, let's pay more attention to the multilateral system. Let's pay more attention to multilateral institutions because when push comes to shove, they're the ones who respond. Right? So that's the second thing I'm encouraged with. Third, we are seeing an amount of public-private partnerships that are win-win, particularly when it comes to finance, pharmaceuticals, and technology. And I think that's really important. Fourth, and finally, we're seeing amazing things in terms of private-private collaboration. Look at what's happening among the scientists. They don't care about borders. They care about solutions. And we're seeing great acts of kindness that are going to be remembered. So I, there is a sunny side, even during this, this awful journey. And we just have to collectively navigate it. And, and, and we have to remember that we have collective responsibilities as well as individual responsibilities. Well, thank you, uh, Mohammed. It's been a fascinating conversation, and thank you for for finishing the way you just did. Because I think we all have to every day look like you do with your daughters. At what are we learning? Uh, how we internalize all of this, and how we all look at humanity and and our collective humanity. So, thank you very very much for doing this. I'm sure that for everybody. You know, it's been a real privilege to listen to you. Uh, no, there is no doubt that you're one of the world's uh, great thinkers. And, and thank you so much for, for your time and for being with us. President Moreno, it's wonderful to thank you. And I must tell you that in my early career at the IMF, someone came in and said to me, you're going to work on Mexico. And I said, but I don't speak Spanish. And, and, and I was told you have six months to learn it. So let me just say muchas gracias. Que le vayan todo muy, muy bien. Muchas gracias a ti. Thank you very much. Bye-bye.